Acts 27 and 9, if you found it, say amen. amen. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous. You better ever feel like life is dangerous? Because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. That's exactly what you want to hear, isn't it? Not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Verse 1 of chapter 28, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, then said among themselves, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom when he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth him, suffereth not to live. And he shook the beast off into the fire and felt no harm. Verse number eight and nine quickly. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands, everybody say hands. hands, laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. I went through at least five iterations of this, tri of this title this morning, and I might change it while I'm preaching, I don't know. I just, I, I finally settled on this thought, a snake-bitten breakthrough. A snake-bitten breakthrough. God, I know you've given me a word for somebody here today. I know you've got a purpose and a plan. And God, I know someone that feels like they've been snake-bitten in life is on the verge of a breakthrough. God, I believe we can see it today. I pray for your anointing on me to preach. Anoint my mind, my spirit, my heart. Help me be in tune with the Holy Ghost. God, I pray you help this congregation to get anointed with me, Lord, and that together we'll allow your spirit to flow in this place and through this ministry. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray, have your way. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Give the Lord a great hand clap of praise this morning as you're being seated in the presence of the Lord. Paul was not one, if you've studied the Apostle Paul very much, Paul was not one to, uh, to go by disorganized methods. The Apostle Paul very often and actually almost always worked in a very organized, structured very detailed manner. He would pray and ask God about where to go. And then he would get a team together, organize helpers, send letters ahead of time to tell them that he and his team were on their way so they would be prepared for a great move of the Holy Ghost. Paul was the master of scheduling revivals, whether being sent by the Holy Ghost to Macedonia or going to Thessalonica or Ephesus or Corinth or one of the many places that his ministry took him, Paul almost always worked by an itinerary. He was very scheduled, very prepared, very planned out. 
But the revival that we're talking about this morning was a revival that was an unscheduled revival. There was no plan for Paul to go to this particular place. The ship's course had been charted, but he was not at all in control. Paul, as a matter of fact, was a prisoner on this particular ship. He was on his way to Rome to to stand trial and to defend himself against charges for that he had gotten for his ministry's sake. The ship's course had been charted to Rome. The captain and his officers had laid out the plan for the entire trip. The ship had began in Alexandria in Egypt and now was headed to Italy. One of the stops was a city of Lycia called Myra and it was there that they picked up prisoners bound for Rome and from Myra. It was just a few days journey and they were now well on their way. The schedule was set, the itinerary was made, the organized plans had been laid out, the chart, the course was charted, of course. And now in verse number 13 of Acts 27, we find out that the Bible said the south wind blew softly. It appeared as if everything was going according to plan. Everything was going according to the schedule. Everything was smooth. Amen. I like it when a plan goes according to how it's written down, don't you? Amen. Amen. The south wind blew softly. It was a gentle breeze. And the Bible said that they supposed that they had obtained their purpose. They thought that everything was just going well. Everything is going well. Good And so, loosing from there, they sailed close by the island of Crete. The south wind blowing softly, a gentle breeze sailing. The sunshine is going to be a good trip. Everything is going to go well. But the Bible said in the very next verse, in verse number 14, but not long after, there arose a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. A hurricane blew up in the Mediterranean. It appears that often when you think that life is going to be smooth sailing, that the storm comes out of nowhere. I know I'm not preaching anybody here but me, so you just let me preach to me this morning. But sometimes when you think that you've got the south wind blowing softly out of nowhere from over the horizon, Lord, from your vision comes a terrible terrible storm. Amen. The Bible said in verse 17 that when they had taken up, they used helps. Helps are chains or ropes that they would wrap around the ship. They would tie everything down. They would make sure that everything was secure so they could weather the storm. The Bible said that they undergirded the ship. Somehow they took those those ropes or those chains and they wrapped them all the way around that old wooden ship so as it it rocks on the seas. I don't know if you've ever been out on a rough sea before. Anybody ever been out on a rough sea before? There's a few of you. I I remember the first time that I went out on the ocean. We had had put in in Tampa Bay, and the, the waters were just a little bit choppy, no big deal. I'd never been out. I'd never been out on the ocean. I'd never been out on the salt water before. And the the waters in the bay were a little bit choppy, but I didn't think anything about it. But once we got out of that bay, that boat would rise up, and then when it would get in the trough of that thing, it would crash down. And that thing, when it got turned sideways in the trough of that wave, at one point, I was way up here. And then that boat would rock, and I'd be right there. And it wasn't long till my face was green like the briny deep. And then I made a donation to it. They had undergirded the ship so that when it gets in that trough of that wave and it crashes down, those wooden planks would not be blown off and the ship to sink. The Bible said, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands or strike a sail, and so were driven. At this point, they're not in control at all. The storm is in control. They can't, the rudder and the sails not doing them any good. Now they're being driven by the storm. I don't know if you've ever been in a place in your life when you felt 
like the storm of your life was so out of control that you were being driven by the storm and you had no control over it. It's one thing after the other. And just when they hoped that it was getting better, it wasn't getting better. Verse number 20, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, the clouds and the storm was so intense that there was no sun to be seen in the day and no stars to be seen at night, not just for one day or two days, but the Bible said in many days and no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. On day one, they knew it was rough, but they didn't think it would last that long. But then day two rolled around, and day three rolled around, and day four. And every day, hope diminished just a little bit more and a little bit more until they finally got to the point, we're not going to make it. All hope was taken away. Fourteen days go by with no sunshine and no stars. Fourteen days of darkness and storm. They begin to check the depth of the water because of the storm. They're now, they don't know where they are. They don't know if they're in deep water, if they're in shallow water. They have been driven by the storm so much. They've been so out of control for so long that now they're trying to figure out how deep is the water? Are we safe? And so they sound to see how deep it is. And they find that it's 20 fathoms. And then they try again, and they've already lost down to 15 fathoms, and now we're about to run aground. Our ship is about to be torn apart. And finally, verse number 41 of Acts 27 says, And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. After two weeks in the storm, 14 days with no sun and no stars, they find a place where two seas meet. I don't know if you've ever been at a place where you see opposing currents coming. Sometimes when you're around these islands, the water will come around the island one direction and then it will meet an opposing current. And when you find that place where you have two currents that come together going different directions, that's where the most violent of the water is. And may I tell you that the storm drove them to a place that they never would have gone on their own. The trial and the storm in their life put them in a place where no good sailor would ever go. But when you feel like you're out of control and you're at the mercy of the storm, you find yourself in a place where there's opposing currents. Can I tell you that one of the reasons an enemy sends the storm is because he's trying to get you into a position that you would not go to if you were on your own. He wants to get you. He wants to get you to a place where there's different currents. Oh, God, I want to preach for a while this morning. I really do. Let me tell you, one of the reasons the enemy sends opposition and storms into your life is because he's trying to put you in a place where there's a current going in the opposite direction of the way that you need to go. And you watch people when they get to a point in their life when the current of holiness and the current of worldliness start colliding. Can I preach to you a little while this morning? When you get yourself in a place where you're not sure if you're going this way or that way, am I going to live for God or am I going to backslide? Am I going to live holy or am I going to be worldly? And where those currents come together is when there's most danger for a shipwreck. Let me tell moms and dads and young people something this morning. You better make sure that your family is in the strong current of holiness living so you don't run aground and your ship become wrecked. Don't let the storms of life get you in a place where you let the current of this society begin to dominate how you live and how you... Oh, I wish somebody would tell me to preach right now. I wish somebody would say praise the Lord right now. The enemy's trying. Well, a lot of times when trials and tests and storms come into your life, what it really is, it's a battle for positioning. God's trying to position you in one way. 
and the enemy's trying to get you to go in a different way. And when those two currents come together in your life and you don't know which way to take, that's when you're most in danger of your family being sunk. Piece by piece, the timbers begin to snap. Board by board, the ship breaks apart. The next thing you know, you're caught in the waves of the sea. Paul thought he was going to Rome, but now he's in a shipwreck. I remember remember a few months ago, probably years now, been years now, yeah. <laughs> a few decades ago. I remember Sister Reinhardt, when she was, uh, was, was over the women's as free, she called me one time and she said, Pastor V, I need you to, uh, to go preach a, a women's prison conference. Uh, she said, I've been praying and I know, I know that the Lord's laid you on my heart to go preach at this prison's conference. And I just preached one in Ohio and and, uh, and I said, well, where, where do you want me to go? She said, well, we've got three coming up. She said, uh, one's in Alaska, one's in Idaho, and one's in Hawaii. I said, praise God, I want to go to all three. I said, well, which one do you want me to go to? She said, you, you pick, you just pick. I said, well, I'll go to Hawaii. <laughs> and then about three days later, she called me back. She said, Brother V, we just got invited to another prison conference, and I, and I really feel like that's the one you need to preach. I said, where is it? She said, Pearl, Mississippi. I said, I thought I was going to Pearl Harbor, not Pearl, Mississippi. Paul thought he was going to Rome, and next thing you know, he's shipwrecked on an island with a bunch of what the Bible called barbarians. He's on his way to see the Colosseum, and now he's just hoping to get himself out of the cold waves of the deep sea. He thinks he's going to see Caesar, but what he's really going is to be a shipwreck. He lands on the island of Melita. He didn't plan on going there. He never dreamed about going to Melita. He thought about Rome, but not Melita. He never thought, it wasn't in his itinerary. He didn't lay out plans. When he was, when he was trying to figure out what was going to go on, he didn't put a line and say, I want to see Melita. No, no, I'm on my way to Rome, but now I find myself detoured by the storms of life. I find myself in a place I never thought I would be, I'm doing things I never thought I'd have to do. I thought I was on a cruise to Rome, but now what I really am is in a fight for my life in the sea. The storm has completely turned everything around. Amen. The storm changed my plans. The storm took my itinerary and wiped it clean. And now when I thought I was going to do this, this, and this, now I just hope I can survive just for a few more moments. Uh, My mind is not about next week, next month, next year. I'm just trying to survive today. Let me tell you that storms in life will come and completely rearrange what you thought you were going to do and what you thought was going to happen. You thought that by now you'd be in a whole different place than you are, but now you're just hoping to make it through the day. If I can make it through the day, maybe I can make it through the week, and it's just a matter of survival. Man, I'm going to tell you, things can change in life in a New York minute. You can have big plans to do something. And then the next moment, the next phone call, the next knock at the door, the next doctor's report, the next whatever, everything can be turned around. You can think you're going to do this and that. But when the storm gets pushing you to places you never dreamed you'd go, it's all you can do just to survive. And now Paul is on an island with a bunch of barbarians, and it's cold. And the barbarians felt so sorry for the shipwrecked people that they start a fire. And Paul gathers a bundle of sticks and he goes to lay them on the fire. And when he puts the sticks above the fire, the heat of the fire awakened a viper 
that was inside of that bundle of sticks and that, that viper. And I like the way the Bible called it. It called it a venomous beast. Every single snake is a venomous beast. Whether they're poisonous or not, they cause heart attacks. My wife, I knew she was afraid of snakes when I married her. I just didn't know she was terrified. When we were first married, we had just gotten here just a couple of weeks before. I don't know if y'all remember Eric Webb, but I put him up to something. I had a rubber snake. I said, go throw this on my wife. I heard her from about a quarter of a mile away, and I'm still in trouble over it. You'd think in 26 years forgiveness would come, but no, I'm in a place where two C's meet. I mean, what in the world, Paul, have you been doing? The barbarians, when they see that this man, he's been shipwrecked, he's been thrown into the sea, we try to warm him up with the fire, and then a snake comes out of the fire and, and, and lays hold of his hand. And the barbarians think, man, he's, he must be a murderer. And God wanted him to die in the sea. And when the sea didn't kill him, God decided, I'll get him another way. You talk about one thing after another. You talk about trial after trial. If, if Paul was a 2021 20, modern day American Christian, he'd have blamed God. And he'd have just backslid and give up. But when the barbarian said he's a murderer and God just decided to kill him anyway, in verse number six, howbeit they looked, when they looked, he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, he's a God. They thought he was a murderer a few seconds ago, and now they think he's a God. Let me tell you that how you react to the things that come into your life is going to determine how people look at you. Praise God. If every time something comes up in your life, some trouble comes up in your life, you're ready to backslide, the whole world's going to say, well, that per I mean, they looked at Paul and said, he must be a murderer because look what happened. But when Paul stayed faithful and just kept on living for God, they turned right around and said, man, that dude, he's got something that we don't have. How you respond to the snake bites in your life will determine if you ever get your breakthrough or not. It's in, your, it's in your reaction to the troubles that come into your life. It's in your reaction about the things that come up when you're just trying to live life. Let me tell you, there's some folks in here today that if I know what the Holy Ghost has been dealing with me about all morning long, there's some people here, and it may be even in your mind, or you may have even said it out loud. You've said, I don't know how much more I can take. I don't know what else I can deal with. It's one thing after another, after another, after another. It's a storm. It's a hurricane. It's a night and day in the deep. It's 14 days of no sun, of no stars. It's one thing after after another and just when I think that I've survived the worst the next thing I know I'm snake bit does anybody here ever feel snake bit that everything you try to do something happens uh, everything you're just trying to do something for God you're just trying to go on your journey but one thing after another let me tell you that what you're dealing with may not at all be the devil it may just be positioning you for your greatest revival that you've ever seen when you keep on going you go from being looked at as a curse to being a testimony of what God can do. You just got to keep going. You got to keep sailing. You got to keep walking. You got to keep working. You got to keep living for God. You just got to keep going. No matter how many things come up, no matter how many trials, you just got to keep on going. 
Oh, I wish somebody would praise the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Oh, come on and worship the Lord. There's some folks here that you've gone through one thing after another and you've wondered, I don't know how much more I can take. You can take everything that comes your way because God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you. You may not be able to make it on your own, but with God, you can survive a hurricane. You can survive a storm. You can survive a snake bite. You can survive whatever that you have to face. You just got to keep on going. They said, You're, he must be a murderer. And then, and then he's a god. Within three verses. Within three verses of a snake bite, now Paul's standing in front of the most powerful man on the entire island. The Bible called him the chief man. He went from being thought of as a man who was cursed to being in the presence of the most powerful man on the entire island. It happened by perseverance through trials. Verse number 8 of Acts 28, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed. What's the next phrase? Can you see it? I heard somebody say, say it out loud. And laid his, what? Laid his what? Hands. You mean that the thing that just a few minutes earlier the serpent was latched onto, the thing that was the source of his pain, is now being used to start a revival? Is that what you're telling me? That the thing, maybe that's why the enemy tried to bite it off of him. Because he knew that in that hand was going to be a hand laying of a miracle. And I got to get the hand off the end of his arm. Because if I don't, there's getting ready to be a revival breakout. You might want to understand that the things in your life that the enemy attacks the most might be the very thing that God wants to use to bring deliverance and revival and breakthrough. That might be why you're having such a struggle in a certain area of your life is because that's the very vehicle that God is planning to use to bring revival to your family. Oh God, man, I feel something up here. I feel it behind this pulpit. I don't know if you feel it out there, but I've come to tell somebody, don't you give up. Don't, you're on the verge of your breakthrough. Don't you let the storm, don't you let it throw you off. My God in heaven, somebody ought to praise the Lord right now. I feel it right now. Somebody's about to get a breakthrough. Hey, glory to God. I wish somebody that's been facing the storm would throw your hands to heaven, open your mouth, and begin to thank God that the storm didn't stop you, and the wind didn't stop you, and the sea didn't stop you, and the serpent didn't stop you. The very thing, the very thing that was the source of his wound became the source of his revival. Oh, God, I wish somebody would get in the Holy Ghost with me right now. I'm telling somebody that's the reason the devil's attacking you where he is, because that's where your testimony is. Amen. That's where your testimony is. And if he can take your testimony now before you get a chance to lay it on somebody else and start a revival, that's why he's trying to use all the storms and all the wind and all the stuff in your life, all the chaos that's going on in your orbit. He's using all of that because he knows that in your hand is a miracle waiting to happen. And all he's got to do, the enemy knows, I got to stop that hand. I got to stop that hand from getting on that man, because if that hand ever gets laid on that man, this whole island's going to see a revival. 
Oh God, I wish somebody would praise the Lord. You don't know how close you are to your revival right now. Hey, Paul, you take that bloody, you take that bloody hand with those viper bites in it. You take that hand that has the, the, the marks of a snake bite and don't you be ashamed of what the enemy tried to do to you. You take that scar and you lay it on that man's head because when you do, there's gonna be a release of supernatural anointing. That's going to happen. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, I'm not afraid uh, of your past troubles. I'm not afraid of your past addictions. Uh, I'm not afraid of your tattoos and all your record. Uh, I know that that's just the thing that God's going to use. So you lift it up and you give it to God because that's the source of your breakthrough. Oh, God, I wish I could preach this to 5,000 people right now. What the devil's trying to stop is why, that's why he's attacking you. Ha, ha, ha. Ooh, Jesus. Oh, God, I feel something about to come down in Bethlehem right now. Does anybody feel what I feel? Does anybody feel? Is it starting to make sense why the devil's been on you so much? Why he's trying to stir up so much chaos in your life? And it came to pass, verse number eight, Acts 28 and eight, I want you to say it with me. And it came to pass that the father of Publius, I don't blame you for struggling there, lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him. The very source of of his pain became the starting point for his revival and healed him. What you've been going through is what God wants to use to help somebody else. What you've struggled with is the very thing that somebody needs to touch them. What if he'd have been so ashamed of his wound? What if he would have been so ashamed of his scar that he would have been afraid to reach out and expose the very thing that hurt the most? Let me tell you, you're going to go through stuff in your life. You're going to have times when you hurt. You're going to have times when you don't know why it's one thing after another and it's one trouble after another. But if you'll not be ashamed and you'll be willing to hold that out and let somebody see what you've been through, that's going to be the source of a revival in somebody's house. They've been waiting for you to be there. For you, it was a tragedy, but for them, it was a godsend. For you, it was a mess, but to them, it was hope. For you, it was for you it was terrible but for them it's what they've been waiting for I know it hurts you but somebody at your work needs to know your testimony I know it's been hard but somebody in your school needs to know what God's brought you through you gotta reach out that source of pain oh God so when this was done verse number 9 so when this was done, others, everybody say others. others. When this was done, others also. He reached out his wounded hand and he touched one man. He reached out his, his wounded hand and Prays for one man. But when he prays for one man, the Bible said, and others also. You're not the only one that needs God. There's people in your world that are waiting to see 
what God can do. Amen. And when he sees it, when, when they see God do it for him, they begin to get faith for themselves. And then others come. You know what it says? When this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island. The island that Paul never would have been at if not for a storm. But now, because he exposed his wound and let God use it for one, now others, 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 right? Come on. Others begins to spread. Apparently there's only men on this island. He's like, yes, that's my kind of island. Amen. We may need a prayer meet. Others. 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 Right? Others. It's not always about you. Sometimes it's all about others. And if I see all my pleasure cruise, if I stay on my, on my trip and my itinerary and my plan, then all those others never get what they need. But because one man extended the source of his pain, all of a sudden others. Throw, throw the next verse up there. I hope I can read without my glasses. Who so honored us with many honors. They called me a murderer about five or six verses ago. But now they're giving me honor. They thought I was a curse to them just a little bit ago. But now they see me as a blessing. The same people who are talking bad about you now, if you're willing to let God use your wounds, those very same people will soon be saying, that dude changed my life. When he told me what God did for him, it began to turn my life around. It began to change everything. When she told me what she's been through and she told me how God helped her, it made me believe that God could help me. And where I thought they were a curse before, now they're a blessing. Amen, brother. Brother Daniel Hale, you guys can sit down. You can do whatever you want. Brother Daniel Hale, I remember Brother Kenny Bass. I was just preaching in Michigan a few weeks ago, and I, I, was, I, I saw Brother Kenny Bass, and he was telling me again how you threatened to beat him up. If you ever told him, if he ever invited you to church again. He, Brother Kenny Bass was a minister in the church he pastors in Michigan, and he used to always go try to get Brother Daniel to come to church, to come to church, and finally Brother Daniel had it up to, well, Brother Bass is about this tall, so he had it up to here with him. And he... He, he said, if you, ever, if you ever mention it to me again, what do you tell him? In a, in a, in a churchy sort of way. <laughs> Basically, you're going to whoop him, right? Yeah. What year did you, guys, did you all get the Holy Ghost? 95, 96. Wow. 27, 20, 27 years ago, right? Amen. Isn't God good? There's been some storms, hasn't there? There's been some snake bites. But you know what? How many people do you reckon you've talked into getting baptized in Jesus' name up around these altars? Aren't you glad Brother Bass wasn't a quitter? He might be a lot of stuff, but he's not a quitter. But he was willing to tell Brother Daniel how God had changed his life. And now, how many people have come to the church because they brought them? And it all begins when one person shows their wound. And what they, you, you used to, Brother, Brother Bass used to get on your nerves. I'm going to whoop you if you ever invite me again. But now when you see him, you can't wait to, to thank him for telling you about the church and about God and about the Holy Ghost. The same people who are fed up with you, when God gets a hold of them, they're going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for not letting the storm stop you. Thank you for not letting the snake bite stop you. Thank you for not letting life throw you out of the church and get you away. It's all the plan of God to get you where you're supposed to be. Throw, throw that last verse. I'm closing here, I think. Yes, yes, yes. And when we departed, they laid at us. They loaded us down mm -hmm. with everything we needed. All the stuff that we threw overboard to try to survive the storm, 
all the stuff we had to we had to get rid of just to make it now God's bringing it all back to us and what I thought I lost I didn't lose at all Whew, glory to God it's a snake bitten breakthrough Paul, would you like to have a revival at Melita, Paul? Let me tell you what's going to happen, Paul. At Melita, you're going you're gonna to meet the, the chief man of the whole island. And you're going to pray for his father, and he's going to be healed. And when that happens, there's going to be miracles across the whole island. And for three months, you're going to have a knockdown, drag out, Holy Ghost revival. It's going to shake that entire island. Paul, would you like to have that kind of revival? Yes, sir. I'll sign up. Let's, yes, sir. I'll do it. I'll do it. All right, Paul, it's going to cost you. Paul, it's going to cost you an arrest. And it's going to cost you a hurricane. It's going to cost you your ship going to cost you days and nights with no light. It's going to cost you a snake bite, Paul. Now do you want that kind of revival? Just leave me on my cruise to Rome. That's why God doesn't always tell us the cost of our revival in advance. Because if he told us, we may not be willing to pay it. And so the stuff you've been through, you can either waste it or you can invest it Amen. in a breakthrough. The storm you've been in, you can go through the storm and let the storm win. Or you can get up on your feet and say, God, I'm still coming. I'm not giving up. I might be snake bitten, but I'm looking for my breakthrough. I've been through some tests, I've been through some trials, I've been through some storms, I've been through some ups, I've been through some downs, I've been through some disappointments, I've been through some hurts. I've been through people talking about me, they, call, they practically called me a murderer, but I wouldn't let what people said about me stop me, I just kept on living. And through all of that, I lived long enough to come out on the other side and all the stuff I lost in the storm, now the very people that thought I was a murderer and were talking about me, now those very people are restoring everything that I thought I had lost, uh, all the stuff that I thought had slipped through my fingers, uh, now I got it back. I've come to tell somebody, don't you stop right now. You may feel snake bitten, but it's just a sign that you're close to your breakthrough. Oh God, everybody stand, and if you will, close your eyes and lift your hands to heaven. I've never preached a throwback service before, so I don't know if this was throwback enough or not. But I do tell you one thing, I know I heard from God for this service. I know I've preached to some folks that you feel like the storm has been driving you. But the snake bite has ended all hope. Come on. Oh God. Come on, Holy Ghost, do your work here. God, you're the healer. You're the help. God, you're the encourager. God, you're the one that speaks to the storm and says, peace be still. But God, you may not calm the storm till I'm at my Melita. And so God, I'm gonna be faithful through my struggle and my trial. I typically, I typically try to make it as easy on people to come to the altar without, without any kind of notice or not. 
without any kind of uh, without any kind of pressure to feel like they've singled out. But I, I'm specifically asking people right now that you feel like you've been in a storm, you feel like you've been snake bit. We're not going to ask you for details. Nobody's going to ask you what's wrong. Nobody is going to ask what you've been through. But if I preach to you, I want you to step out because this message was sent for you first. Come on, it's all right, you can come. You are not alone. Come up, come on, come on, come on. You're ready to see the hand of God begin to move in this altar. In Jesus' name, we're getting ready to see God lift somebody's spirit. Some of you are carrying emotional wounds, some spiritual wounds, some physical wounds. There's all kinds of wounds here. There's all kinds of difficulties and struggles and trials. But just symbolically, what we're going to do is we're just going to, like, like Paul reached out his snake-bitten hand, I'm just gonna ask you just to lift your hand in, in solidarity with Paul. Just lift your hand as a sign that I'm not letting the storm or the snake bite stop me. In the name of Jesus, God, I'm asking you to meet these men and women and young people in this altar today. God, by the authority of your word, I pray, God, release your glory. Come on, can you help me pray? Maybe you can reach over and lay your hand on somebody close to you if you want to and begin to ask God to release his help and strength. In the name of Jesus, oh God, these are your people and I pray your hand on them. God, I've released by the authority of your word the power of your anointing. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for the ability to endure the storm and the snake bite. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, that's right. Lift your voice and pray. There's a deliverance. There's a deliverance here. In the name of Jesus, I pray for a release of peace. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, God, to place peace on somebody's heart and mind and their family and their soul. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, God, let your anointing of the Holy Ghost flow here. God, in the name of Jesus, that's right. Let's pray one for another. God, I pray for help in the midst of the storm. I pray, God, for peace in the name of Jesus to flow among these men and women. In the name of Jesus, that's right. Lift your voice and pray the Holy Ghost is moving here. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. God, these are my brothers. God, these are my sisters, Lord. God, I pray the blessing of your hand upon them. God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, let there be a breakthrough to be released in Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord. Weakness blurs my vision. Oh, God, grant your fresh anointing in Jesus' name. God, let it be in the name of the Lord. God, I pray, touch these. In the name of Jesus, let your blessings flow here. I've never been forsaken. In the name of the Lord, I've had to stay on one test. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost flow here. In the name of Jesus. As I look at all my victory. Amen. Can you help me pray for a breakthrough? Can you help me pray for a breakthrough for somebody? In the name of Jesus.
in them. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for my church family. Let your mercy and grace, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost be on them. God, I pray, let the joy and peace of your spirit rest on them, Lord. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray you visit their homes with your mercy and with your peace, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus, let them walk in the power and the glory of your spirit, Lord Jesus. Let your hand be on them, their homes, their families, their lives, their children, mind, body, and spirit, oh God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am excited to be dedicating Emberly May Louise Lumpkin. baby, if you will. Families, all, will, all, all welcome to come if you'd like to. Amen. While you're going back to your seats, we're not dismissed yet. In a few moments, we'll have you bring your tithe. Remember tonight's service, Brother Mike Wilson, Brother Mike Bingham. We're going to have Mike and Mike. Amen. This is a beautiful, sweet child. Amen. What an awesome family. Amen. Amen. Brother Josh, you might need to turn me up. Kimberly May Louise Lumpkin was born at four pounds and eight ounces on November the 21st of 2020. This baby loves to praise the Lord. Hey, sweetheart, she's smiling at me. She's a gift from God. What a sweet, sweet baby. We're here today in one of the most blessed things that a church can participate in. The children that open the womb are the heritage of the Lord. They are a gift from God. They are a trust that God gives to a family and to a church. And so the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number six, in verses six and seven, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The commandment of God is for parents to diligently teach their children. And in honor to this command and in obedience to the commandment of the Lord, Brother Daniel and Sister Jonna have come to present this beautiful little girl to the Lord. The Bible said that Hannah prayed. And after years of her womb being shut up, the Bible said that the Lord remembered her. And Hannah said, for this child I pray, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And so this family has brought Emberly May Louise to lend her to the Lord all the days of her life. This child was born with a divine purpose and a divine destiny. This child was given life by God for purpose. And these parents realize that. And they have come because they want to see God's hand on this child's life. The precedent comes again in the life of our Savior. When the Bible says that Mary and Joseph took him and presented him in the temple, and it was there that he came to be about his father's business. 
And so this baby dedication, as I say, with every baby dedication, is really found in the purpose of Brother Daniel and Sister Jada. What we really are doing today is they are dedicating themselves to raise this child in the truth. Paul said, provoke not your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And so these faithful parents who love to work for God have brought this child. She is looking at me with those beautiful blue eyes. Hey, sweetheart. And so if it's your intention to present Emberly May Louise Lumpkin to the Lord and to pledge yourselves to bring her up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, I want you to answer we do to the following promises. Do you here on this day recognize that this child is a gift from God? Do you dedicate this child to the Lord who gave her to you? Do you promise to give this child every possible benefit of home, school, and church and to protect and provide for her? Do you here this day ask God's blessing upon her life to guide and guard and direct her through all of her years? The most important two. Do you promise to always raise this child in the truth of God's holy word, putting the Lord first in all matters? And do you promise to live an example of faithfulness, holiness, and virtue before this child in such a way that your words and actions do not conflict? Amen. Bishop Wilson, will you help me? I've asked Bishop Wilson, if he would, to, uh, to pray. Shall we bow our heads? Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious child. Thank you for these parents that have brought her to give her back to you today. God, I ask you to give her grace and strength. Put something in her that will cause her want to live for you. Someday be baptized in the lovely name of Jesus and fill with the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. Put convictions and a love for serving you in her heart and mind. Touch her body, give her grace, continue to keep her in good health. Bless these parents, Lord, give them wisdom to direct her life. The example, God, that they need to be, not only these parents, but this entire wonderful family. God, let them be the example they need to be. Help them to lead her in the paths of godliness and holiness and righteousness. In Jesus' name, we give this child to you today. Amen. 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 I don't share this, I don't share this with very many people. <laughs> it's Brother Wilson, and that's the end of the list. Isn't that awesome? Isn't she beautiful? Amen. Be free at 5 o'clock, prayer at 6 o'clock, church at 6.30. Brother Mike Bingham, Brother Mike Wilson, going to have a great time. You can bring your tithe to the storehouse and be dismissed at your discretion.